first of all, thank you. I want to thank all of you for staying here at 3 o'clock on a Friday afternoon in December. Yeah. Uh, we're all a little bit, a little bit loony. Um, we actually had, by the way, the staff of the committee is only two of us. Um, we are the smallest state agency that actually does anything. I'll leave the rest to your imagination. And we had our holiday luncheon today uh, with the people down the hall. They, 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 they permitted us to join them. And uh, I had to leave a little bit early to be here, and they said, what the hell are you doing? But here we are, and it's beautiful, and I'm glad to be here. How many of you are unfamiliar with the Committee on Open Government? All right, a few, a few who tell the truth. Okay, again, uh, the committee uh, is housed in the Department of State. I'm a state employee. And um, we have really a pretty simple job. And by the way, the committee is a creation of law. It's part of the Freedom of Information Law. Created in 1974 when I was loaned temporarily to this new office that had no staff and no budget. And we're almost in the same place now. But uh, in any case, all we do all day, every day, is give advice either orally or in writing to anybody who has a question about what's public and what's not, primarily in relation to two laws, our Freedom of Information Law and the Open Meetings Law. And when I suggest to you that we give advice to, to anybody, I mean exactly that. We take loads of inquiries from people from state and local government, more from local government officials than any other group, from members of the public, members of the news media, it doesn't matter. Our only goal is to give what we believe to be the right answer under the law, regardless of who asks the question. So we're not there to support the government, we're there to do the right thing. And, and I'm not suggesting that they are mutually exclusive. <laughs> um, in the past, some of you may recall, I used to do a little handout called Your Right to Know. Well, we're out of print and it's out of date, and we don't have the money to print them anymore, but, but, we have a new updated version on our website, which is so much more useful. Why? If you have a printed version, and I could have done that, you wouldn't be able to take advantage of the links. There are links to any number of additional areas of information. To find our website, simply Google COOG for Committee on Open Government, because we're the only Committee on Open Government in the world. And from there, to, to get that publication, you will just scroll over the publications. You'll see a series of drop-down boxes. Click onto your right to know. Um, we also have the text of the laws, obviously. Um, we have a little section called, I want to. I want to make a FOIA request. I want to respond to a FOIA there are, there are many uh, responses to typical questions. We also have the usual FAQs, most important for so many people. I mentioned that we write advisory opinions. This will sound a little ridiculous. We've written in the neighborhood of 25,000 over the course of years. They are indexed by key phrase. One index deals with FOIL, the Freedom of Information Law, the other the Open Meetings Law. They are intuitive kinds of indices. So if you have a question about notes, <coughs> you could go to our Freedom of Information Law Index, click on to end, scroll down to notes, and the opinions prepared since 1993 are available online in full text. Um, I'm not going to tell you that our opinions are binding. They are not. If you read an opinion that you don't like, you can throw it away and say, Freeman, <laughs> Freeman doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. That is your choice. That's your choice. Uh, the hope, of course, is that the opinions are educational, persuasive, that they encourage knowledge of and compliance with law, and for what it's worth, where the courts have reviewed our opinions, they've agreed probably 90 to 95% of the time. So, uh, again, the goal is to uh, encourage compliance, the goal is to avoid and resolve disputes. Now, I am here for you. Um, I can talk about this from now until doomsday if you <laughs> let me. But if you do, we'll miss the issues that are really important and troubling to you. So, do you have a preference? FOIL, Open Meetings Law? What do you like? Open Meetings. Open Meetings. Why? We have trouble with them here. You have trouble with Open Meetings? <laughs> Huh. Well, what? It's, uh, you know what I'm interested in is no, I'm I don't. <laughs> I don't. I'm newly elected to the board of supervisors, and I understand that most of the committees that actually create the resolutions for that board yeah. don't take minutes. 
and don't have any record of their, so I, when, when someone retires from the board, there's this huge loss of institutional memory, Not and, and on top of that, there's a lack of transparency in how government actually runs and these decisions are made, and you're, that. You're, you're so right. To, uh, thank you, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm concerned about, you know, I'm very concerned, about, but to me also, because, mainly because the historical, is, the institutional memory is lost, but then how do you as a newly elected official get up to, snuff on what's going on, you know, in a way that, you know, it, it, at least is on, on well, a base you, you, level. You just may not be able to do it now. Okay, great. All right? You're going to <laughs> you're gonna have to create your own history and talk to lots of people. But, but, first of all, um, just to put this in perspective, the Open Meetings Law is applicable to so-called public bodies. A public body is an entity consisting of two or more members that carries out some, some sort of governmental function collectively as a body like your Board of Supervisors. At the end of that definition, specific reference is made to any committee or subcommittee or similar body of such body. So if the how many members are on the Board of Supervisors? 19. 19, so its quorum is 10. Um, let's say that it designates a committee consisting of five. That committee consisting of five would itself be a public body, its quorum would be three. So if three out of the five get together in their capacities as mem members of that committee, to talk about the business of the committee, yes, that would be a meeting covered by the open meetings law. Now, we go to your question, minutes, minutes. One of the difficulties, I suppose, is that the open meetings law contains what you might view as minimum requirements concerning the content of minutes. At a minimum, they must consist of a record or summary. You could sit down if you want. I've been sitting all day. You've been sitting all day. Mm -hmm. You need not whisper. <laughs> um, minutes have to consist of a record or summary of motions, proposals, resolutions, action taken, and the vote of the members. They may include more, but they can't include less. Um, Could you go over that again? I know you know motions. it by heart, uh, but motions, You're assuming proposal, too much. Is that red light on because there's still coffee back there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just curious. Yeah. Motions, proposals, motions, resolutions. Motions, proposals, resolutions, action taken and the vote of the members. So in actual fact, because we have quite extensive uh, minutes, we have our new town here, we could, we, could, we could do less than what we're doing now. You could do less, um, you, could do, you could do more if you want. Just, just less. But at the county level, they can only go to a different higher level. And take no action at all, in which case, technically, there's no obligation to prepare minutes. Now, for what it's worth, and you may know this, the Open Meetings Law was amended not terribly long ago to reflect the progression of judicial decisions concerning an area where there was no statutory law, the ability to record a meeting. Anybody can either tape record or video record or broadcast an open meeting so long as the use of the equipment is not disruptive or obtrusive. So if you, for example, as a member or John or Jane Q. Public would like a detailed rendition of what transpired, Anybody can record the meeting. Anybody can record the meeting. Um, in my experience, one of the difficulties with recording exceedingly detailed minutes is that five years from now, when you want to figure out what the board did, you have to wade through all that garbage in order to get to the meat of whatever it may be. Um, and in many instances, I, my, my belief is that those minimum requirements probably are enough. Now, in some cases, yeah, I can understand why you may want more than the three-line resolution. Just to give you some background, maybe the minutes will serve you well, maybe they won't. But again, if you have a recording, um, that's, that's, that's a really a, a terrific record if there is a possibility of litigation, it's a, if it's an immensely complex issue, if there is a debate where you want to capture all sides of the argument, it's a good thing to do. Uh, for what it's worth, how many of you know that there are laws that deal with the retention and disposal of records? A couple, a couple. Uh, for you, it's Article 57A of the Arts and Cultural Affairs Law. It tells us that we have too many damn laws in New York. <laughs> but in Article 57A, there are provisions that deal with records management, and in essence, now, uh, under the aegis of the Commissioner of Education, the State Archives develops schedules which indicate minimum retention periods for various classes of records, 
you can go onto the State Archives website. It's called the MU1. We have the new clerk who's writing this down. Yeah, yeah, and you are, by law, the records management officer. Yeah, you got to know this stuff. So just to give you an example, um, and I don't know the retention schedule, but this comes up all the time. A tape recording has to be kept for four months. At the expiration of that period, you can erase it, discard it, do whatever you want. The minutes, on the other hand, which are essentially the official record of whatever the public body might be, have to be kept forever forever. And in between, you have a variety of schedules which generally relate to the significance of the records. Okay. Questions about that? Does that help you at all? Yes, I'm, although I'm interested, an open meeting clerk so then would to apply at the county level. The Board of Supervisors of 19 has appointed a committee of four for the water. Of its own members, yeah. Or committed, commi a committee of three. Yeah. So two if of those. two or more. Two or, or, two or a quorum. As an open, as it's, it's under the open meeting law, so I could actually attend that meeting. Yes, you could. I won't win me any friends, I imagine. And as many I, friends as you'd like. <laughs> <laughs> I'd like a few. Um, and, and I could. It may be all she's got. I don't take know. minutes. Take minutes. <laughs> my own minutes. I could take my own you notes. Could, you could take your own notes. Okay. You could record. You could do whatever you want. Unless as long, it, well, and as so long as it's then I'm assuming stuff. they're required. There's a minimum. Uh, is there a requirement for them to post when these committee meetings are happening? To post, yes, of course. You're talking about notice. Yes. Right. Again, notice. the open meetings law is applicable to public bodies. A committee is itself a public body. Every public body must give notice of the time and place prior to a meeting. And it's a simple requirement. If a meeting is scheduled at least a week in advance, notice has to be given not less than 72 hours prior to the meeting. If it's scheduled less than a week in advance, the law says that notice must be given, quote, to the extent practicable at a reasonable time prior to the meeting. Now, the notice requirement is either two or threefold, depending upon your capabilities. Notice also always must be given to the news media. The news and I say, excuse me? Who is the news media? Uh, um, the news media. I would consider the news media to include a professional journalist. A professional journalist is somebody who, for gain, disseminates news to the public. Um, excuse me? It can't be a freebie newspaper. No, and it's, it's not, not a blog, and it's not right. a freebie. It's, it's, it's a, a professional a professional organization. Can you Where, tell me the line of code that makes these requirements? Yeah, yeah. it's in, it's in <laughs> the State Civil Rights Law, Section 79G. <laughs> it's either 79G or H. Okay, thank you. All right, we have definitions. And also, it could be I'm not done. <laughs> <laughs> the notice must be given to the news media, and I emphasize the word given, because there's no obligation ever to pay to place a legal notice to comply with the open meetings law. There may be in the case of a hearing, but not a meeting. And there are many instances in which notice is given to the news media, and the news media ignores it. We had a meeting today, Committee on Open Government, this morning, 10 o'clock you wouldn't have read about it in any newspaper because even though we gave notice to everybody, they decided not to publish it. That's their call. Second, the law says and has always said that notice must be posted in one or more designated conspicuous public locations. The key word is designated so that the public will always know, yep, the notice is going to be posted on the front door of the post office or the town hall or whatever it might be. Third, today, 2011, if you have the ability to post your notice online, yes, you should be doing that as well. Yeah. Um, Dixie. Yes. Do Can you do the designated public place in lieu of the uh, newspaper? No. Both. Yeah. What if oh. your paper is only published once a week? C'est la vie. <laughs> C'est la vie. You can only schedule a meeting. No. No, you can schedule it whenever you want. You can schedule it whatever you want. That is not your problem. That is not your problem. And aside from that, the weekly publication has the ability to send a reporter, irrespective of when it receives the notice. And third, in so many instances, a board will, at the beginning of the year, at its organizational meeting, develop a schedule. Yes, we will always hold our meetings on the second Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. in town hall, or something like that. In that situation, if you transmit one notice to the news media, post your notice continually in the designated location, leave the notice up on your website if you've got one, 
you're complying with law. You're complying with law for the entirety of the year or whatever the period might be. The only instance in which you'd be required to give a different or an additional notice would involve the unscheduled meeting. Mm -hmm. okay. But you would still send that to the newspaper, even though the newspaper may not come out until after the fact. Not your problem. Okay. Not your problem. But don't, you know, you send it to, you send it, every law, every law is required to be implemented in a way that is reasonable. Um, you might send it to the Woodstock Times, but not to the Los Angeles Times, yes. <laughs> yes. Sweet, two, two sweet who, who enforces, I mean, if you have a meeting that is breaking the law, uh -huh. who enforces, um, no. Who? Yeah. Not me. No, it's not um, <laughs> No, it's, it's John or Jane Q. Carter. If a person is aggrieved, he or she can initiate a judicial proceeding. Now, for what it's worth, the enforcement provisions in the Open Meetings Law have changed a couple of times within, within the recent past. Um, number one, if, if somebody brings a lawsuit and the court finds that substantial deliberations, that's the phrase in the law, occurred in private that should have occurred in public, the court must award you attorney's fees. Ha! Huh. Second, if a board has taken action that was preceded by a failure to comply with the open meetings law, the court has the ability to invalidate the action taken. Third, and this is a recent provision, some consider it to be absolutely the worst penalty that could possibly be imposed under the open meetings law. A court can order training given by. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, there have been a couple of such orders, and uh, you know, one of them was a school board, and they said, "Should we come to Albany?" I said, "Uh, -uh we're doing it on your home turf. Anybody will have the ability to be there." Yes, the TV camera was there. Uh, the news media was there. There were people there from from surrounding communities. The point is that it should be an education. Now, also, for what it's worth, a lot of people don't like to go to court. I can understand that. My belief is that the court of public opinion is much more significant in so many instances than is the judicial court. You know, if, if the public has the sense that the, the government doesn't care, what do you do? You vote the rascals out. You vote the rascals out, or you make life exceedingly uncomfortable. And I think that that's fine. I think that's the way it ought to be. Yes. Um. Very specific question about open meeting laws sort of subset, Julia. I'm actually a reporter, but arguably not a real reporter. Why? Why? Because I run my own media publication for game. For game. Very, well, there you are. Well, that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Something is better than nothing. Okay, all right. right? Okay, so I'm You are indeed a professional journalist. Yeah. All right. That means you're covered by the shield law. That's where that provision is. is. I will raise my vote accordingly. <laughs> also, it means that you can let me know at your public meetings and then you're covered. <coughs> Anyway, um, she's cute, huh? Do you perform on stage too? Only occasionally. Most of us do. Yeah, it's a problem. Um, <laughs> you call one of my my kids the thespian. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are you implying? Um, I wasn't implying actually. <laughs> so, I know that some uh, committees of some local government institutions that are made up of a couple people, three or four can make decisions, um, or have made decisions, over email. Uh-uh. That's what I thought. Uh-uh. Can't do it. Can't so that's do not it. a public meeting? Can they, well, can they informally shh, hold each other? Shh, shh, shh. Okay. As we look at the open meetings law, as we look at the open meetings law, and, and this goes back to the very early days of the law, one of the key provisions involves the term meeting. What is a meeting? What is a meeting? And early on, it was contended by many, many boards, councils, commissions around the state, well, we're just getting together to talk. We're not going to take any action. This isn't a meeting. It's a, it's a workshop. It's a work session. It's, a, you know, it's everything but a meeting. Well, the issue went to the Court of Appeals, the state's highest court. Uh, by 1978, one year after the open meetings law went into effect, it involved so-called work sessions held solely for the purpose of discussion by the city council in Newburgh. And the Court of Appeals said very simply that any time a majority, a quorum, gathers to conduct public business, even if there's no intent to take action, regardless of what the gathering is called, yes, that is a meeting covered by the Open Meetings Law. Point number two. We look at the statement of legislative intent 
that appears right at the beginning of the Open Meetings Law. And it says that the public has the right to attend, to listen, and to observe the performance of public officials. Ha! Huh, observe. Um, going back now about 20 years, you know, we had our, our, our meeting today, the Committee on Open Government, uh, to, to complete our annual report to the governor and the legislature. We make legislative proposals. Well, 20 years ago, one of the issues that came up was, um, huh, in consideration of the technology <coughs> that may enable people to conduct meetings by telephone conference call, by video conferencing, it was before email, really, was, mm -hmm. was, 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 uh, had proliferated. Um, what do we do? And one of my members, who happened to be on a city council, was, he was cute. He was, he was even cuter than you. He said, um, he said, wouldn't it be great if I could participate in meetings from my living room? You know, I wouldn't have to face my constituents and nobody would see who's whispering in my ear. Huh. Well, for that very reason, we recommended an amendment to the law, which years later became law. And it authorized meetings to be held by means of video conferencing. Not telephone, not email, video conferencing. So there are only two ways in which a valid meeting can be held, and action can only be taken at a meeting. Those two ways involve the physical convening of a majority, or the virtual convening by means of video conferencing, whereby people in two or more locations can all observe one another. Um, there is case law, in fact, goes back to the olden days when people used to talk on the phone a lot, um, where a board, a town board, took action by phone, one by one by one by one. The court said, uh-uh, can't do it, can't do it. Uh, there was another case, an appellate division decision, not rendered terribly long ago. State board, five members, full strength, only three left. Lots of our boards have vacancies because we've had so many governors in the past few years. That they, Question? They, they, they have bigger fish to fry. Um, but in any case, there were two members who were physically present. A third member participated by phone. It would have been the same if he, he or she did by email and voted. And the court said, uh-uh, can't vote by phone. You cannot be counted toward a quorum. You must either be physically present or present virtually by means of video conferencing. Does that help you? Very much. Good. Yes. Oh, um, talking a lot about video, I'm shooting the conference. I just wondered if you were aware that you were facing with your back to the camera, and most of what you're saying is probably not going to be au legibly audible on the tape, unfortunately. Uh, Some of it may be. Where do you want me to go? Well, it's just, it's just that I was uh, just so that I could see you, uh, mm -hmm. not your back of your head. I got a question. <coughs> on, open, I'll try, I'll try. Everybody should move <coughs> open, on, on open meetings law, Yes. we're talking about committees now. We're talking about public, public government bodies. Government yes. Bodies. yes. Public committees, subcommittees, you know, environmental commission or something like that. No, what do you like think? You know, if three members of the town board yes. show up at one of those show commissions. Up. Just show up. Just show up. Sit in the crowd. Right. Yeah. Then it's okay. It's fine. Think about it. Because it's still public, right? Is that the reason why? Is it because it's still public? The point is that they are going, not as town board members necessarily, as functioning as a body. But right. what, are you talking about, uh, just as an example, um, let's say that uh, in this group there are three members of a particular board. Um, would anybody walk in here and say, hmm, looks like, smells like, tastes like a meeting of the town board? Well, the answer would be no. No, you're talking about town business. Suppose it's a economic development commission. Okay. You know, you're talking about Who's economic development. Yeah. Or residents of the town are appointed to this commission. Okay. And you have three board members show up. Okay, just show up. Well, Sit in the crowd, or are they functioning uh, as a board? Two, two, are usually, two are usually on that commission. Okay. So we always put two. Okay. But if a third shows up... Yeah. And what does that third person do? Does he just sit in the crowd? Yeah. Then the open meetings... Are, how could that person have a lesser are way we, to attend that's what, than John okay. or James okay. Public? Well, we were always so it careful about it, it that wouldn't we wouldn't even allow that. It wouldn't transform that gathering into a town board. I didn't think so. Yeah. Now, if on the other hand... Three of the board members all of a sudden, you know, went up to the dais or whatever it is and started functioning as a board. Well, then they'd probably be meeting as the town board without having given proper notice. But we didn't need to go to that extent. No, you did not. Okay. Yes, you look so. Yes, how are you? Good. <laughs> um, I didn't know that you were Madame Lafarge. 
<laughs> Nobody get, somebody gets it. <laughs> no? Uh, Leading? And uh, crochet. The guillotine deer. But, oh, oh, oh. Tale of Two Cities. Leading. Okay. Go ahead. Um, Cuomo and the Republican Caucus. Open Cuomo and the Republican not. Caucus. Ooh. Huh. Um, funny thing about that. <laughs> <laughs> so we look at FOIL and basically it says all records are available except records or portions of records that fall within a series of exceptions. We look at the open meetings law and it says that a board can close the doors to enter into an executive session in conjunction with eight grounds for entry into executive session. Now the phrase executive session is defined to mean a portion of an open meeting during which the public may be excluded. So an executive session is not separate from a meeting, it's a part of a meeting. To go into an executive session, and I hope everybody knows this, a simple procedure has to be accomplished in public. It involves three elements. Number one, somebody has to introduce a motion to close the doors. Second, the motion has to, in, has to indicate what you want to talk about. And third, the motion has to be carried by a majority vote of the total membership, notwithstanding absences or vacancies. From there, we look at the eight grounds for entry into executive session. As the reporter, I've said this many times, and you engage in the Tracy Chapman principle. Anybody remember Tracy Chapman? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, well, what's the Tracy <coughs> Chapman principle? Baby, just give me one reason, and I'll turn right back around. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, now, we've talked about the executive session. There is a second vehicle under which what otherwise would be a meeting can be closed. It involves exemptions. There are three exemptions. If an exemption applies, the open meetings law does not. Can it's just. Can you give us the eight grounds and the three exemptions? No, because okay, most of them don't come up. Okay. I'll give you the eight. Should I give you the eight? They're in our they're in our handout. Okay. You, know, you can print out the eight? open meetings. Now. Okay. I'll, okay. I'll look it up. Sorry. <laughs> everybody everybody knows which are the most common grounds for entry into executive session, right? What's the most common word for entry into executive session? Litigation. No Litigation. Are you from Suffolk County? <laughs> <laughs> personnel. Before personnel. We, before yeah. we get there, and we will. Eliminate the word personnel from your vocabularies. It does not appear anywhere in the eight grounds for it. <gasps> she said, yeah. her mouth hung open. I've been um, escorted for meetings. You've been escorted? Yes. I've been kicked out. <laughs> anyway, it's the three. Really, it's not one of them? I'll get there in a minute. I didn't think anybody would even be awake this time of the afternoon on Friday. <laughs> Anyway, three exemptions. If an exemption applies, the open meetings law doesn't. It's just as though the open meetings law doesn't exist. One of the exemptions pertains to so-called political caucuses. And it's been part of the law since it went into effect on January 1, 1977. And of course, from the beginning, the question was, what is a political caucus? Well. We offered our opinion, <clears throat> five courts agreed with us. And it was pretty simple. Um, and I should illustrate, the key case came out of the city of Rochester. Um, nine members on the city council, eight Democrats, one Republican. The eight Democrats always would get together before their regular meeting to talk about what they were later going to discuss at the open meeting. So the caucuses were two hours, the open meetings were 10 minutes, the ninth guy in the Gannett newspapers <laughs> got heaved. <laughs> And they sued, and they won. They agreed with our opinion. And the opinion was, if a majority gets together to discuss public business, irrespective of the political party affiliation, it's not really a political caucus. It's really a meeting. Uh, the converse, if indeed members of a political party get together to discuss political party business, the answer is different. It would be a political caucus. The open meetings law wouldn't apply. That was the law until 1985, when a reporter, still with the New York Post, um, as I understand the situation, wrote to the Speaker of the Assembly and pretty much said, um, unless you open your caucuses, within two weeks we're going to sue you. Well, the state legislature, in uncharacteristic fashion, changed the law practically overnight. Overnight. And since 1985, it has said that a closed political caucus can be held by the members of a political party who serve in the Senate, the Assembly, or the legislative body of a county, city, town, or village, and they may do so to discuss anything. 
including public business, and the law also says that they can invite staff or guests. Huh. So what about this caucus the other day? What about this caucus? I was actually, anybody know who Susan Arbetter is? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did her show yesterday on this very subject. And um, it was interesting, I was talking to a state senator the other day, and, and we, we talked a little bit about, about um, uh, the lawsuit uh, that involved the status of this political caucus. He's a Republican. Well, you probably know that the Senate is 32 to 30. You need 32 to trigger the application of the Open Meetings Law. He told me that he can't remember any time during which he was present when the governor was there too. That means that there probably were 31 or less. If there were 31 or less, the issue disappears because the open meeting law would not have applied in any case. There would not have been a quorum. But let's say for the moment that there was a majority. Let's say that there were 32. Then you have a question of law. And that's what the court said. There's a question of law. Is it still a valid closed caucus if you have people from one political party serving in the state senate and then this Democrat who comes in to talk to them? I don't know the answer. I don't know the answer. I'm going to guess that he might be considered a guest. And that, and that therefore, well, that's what the law says. It says staff or guests. You know, I can't, I can't make it up as I go along. Um, <laughs> although sometimes some of you know that. Oh, well. You do it all again. But um, so that, that, is, that is the issue that I suppose remains. But, you know, as I said to Susan the other day, I don't know if anybody has the ability at this point to do a head count, to do a head count. Um, were there really 32 members of the Senate there, all of whom were from the same political party? If the answer is no, again, there's no issue in terms of the open meetings law. Now, let me ask you, is anybody here associated with a board, a county legislature, a town board, a city council, a village board, where all of the members are of the same political party? I'm not on it, but in my town, that's the way it is. In your town, that's the way it is. And well, there's always a group. There's always there's a group. never dissent at the meeting. Do they hold closed caucuses, or do they just do it? You don't know, do you? I don't know. <laughs> you don't I go know. To the, I go to the meetings, and there's just all this, like, a nodding of heads and very, no, almost no dissent. It's the bobblehead no thing, right? <laughs> 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 anyway. Curly. Uh, Curly. Oh, Curly. Is Sal Vucci still there? No. <laughs> no, huh? Um, I was just curious. It used to be a great restaurant. What, 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 but let me, let, me, let, me just, let me just go there. Um, there's a case. Now, let's think about the state legislature. Two houses, right? And historically, there have been years and years and years where one house was led by Democrats, one by Republicans. And the notion when they changed the law in 85 was, well, gee, you know, if we have to discuss public business in public as a political party organization, we're going to be telegraphing our strategy to the other side. Well, there was a case out of the city of Buffalo where the city council consisted entirely of Democrats. And they wanted to hold a closed caucus to discuss the budget. Well, the Buffalo News brought a lawsuit. And the court said, huh, there's no opposition. There's nobody to whom you would telegraph your strategy. Therefore, in the situation in which all of the members are from the same political party, a closed political caucus can be held only when the discussion involves purely political party business. If, on the other hand, the discussion involves public business, it has to be held, held open to the public. Go to our website. Go to the advisory opinion listing. <coughs> click on oh, Open Meetings Law Listing. Click on P for political caucus. And you will want to see the case of Buffalo News, of, uh, yeah, Buffalo News versus City of Buffalo. Um, and that will lead you to the decision. You can take any of the opinions and put it in their faces if you want. <laughs> that was a smile. That was a snicker. I, I liked it. I don't even have it. I'm sure that they meet in advance. You think? Have, you think? Yes. Not necessarily. Well, they could no, not voter email or something. Well, well the, other, the other thing, the other thing. You know, let me, just, let me just make a point. You know, I told you we had our meeting in the Committee on Open Government today. Um, they don't live with the law every day the way I do, the way Camille Jobin Davis does, our assistant director. We are the only two people in the world who live with this every day of our lives. Um, in order to fill in the committee members about what's important, what we think, yeah, we send them a draft report. And this was our third meeting to discuss the report, but 
The meeting today only took an hour. So even though the report may be, I don't know, 25, 30 pages replete with legislative recommendations, sometimes the written recommendation, if you will, is just so absolutely clear and convincing that there's no need to discuss an issue ad nauseum. But if they're all just shaking their heads, every issue, every meeting. if they're all just shaking their heads, chances are pretty good that your suspicion is, is on the mark. Well, I'm an independent, and the rest, the rest of the board is democratic, and I'm supported by both parties. You mean so Democrat? Democrat. Okay. Well, they're Democrat. Okay. But you know what? I, in, I've been on the town board for four years. Once did somebody vote no, I, and it, and I can tell you, nobody gets ahead. It was just, and for every single meeting, every piece of paper. There's, there's put out, for, you, people can come in before the meeting, you know, the public can come in, pick up those pieces of paper, the public, we run our meetings, we're talking about open meetings, we run our meetings where in the middle of something, that we are from Marble Town. Somebody I've, could stand trained, up in the back of the room and I've say, I have a question. I've trained this town clerk so well, they, they know. That oh, they, she is incredible. They know that they she's, can't do it. She's anything. leaving. Well, our, she's on her left, she's 30 she's, some years there. She's, she's about my age, yeah. that's why. But what she's happens is, old. is that in our meetings, people can stand up in the middle and say, hey, I got a question. And we're like, bring it on, because <laughs> the meetings get pretty dull. And if, we don't get, if we don't get feedback, I mean, we open ours up yeah, and say, questions. please, come to the meetings, ask of course, questions. you know that not every supervisor in Marble Town has felt the way that you do. Not in the past, no. That's what I'm saying. But it has, but I find it's, it's more refreshing now because, you know, it's much easier to be. Is it? All isn't out. it though? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. It's, it really and, is. You know, you know, and the other, the other reality, at least in my opinion, you know, in Washington, yeah, there's a stark difference in the political points of view, views of Republicans and Democrats. But not in town. Is there a real distinction in terms of? Well, should we fill the potholes or should we not? Is that a Republican or a Democrat? <laughs> it's malarkey, it's garbage, it's all ins versus outs, that's all it is. That's all it is, and yes, Dixie, you had another question. Yes. And then um, we go back to Kelly. Coming in, in January, I will be taking over as supervisor, and I've served as supervisor before, thank uh -huh. you. Um, we have, on, on our board, we have just had a resignation at the last meeting last week, which leaves an empty seat. Um, the board has voted to fill that empty seat in January. And we have a tie vote as a result of the November election. Mm -hmm. So we now mm -hmm. will have two vacant seats to be filled. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure Three we have, people left on the board. Right. So we're pretty sure we have that. We've got a deal worked out between the got parties, a deal and I think we're out. okay. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> Here's my situation. How do we handle at the meeting oath of office and seating? these people? Do we seat them first? Do we administer oath of office? What's, I have what's no the idea. protocol? I have no idea. It has nothing to do with the open meetings. I have no idea. And I can't imagine it makes a damn bit of difference. Can you? No, that does. Because does it? Because, no, if there's, a, there's an unexpired, because if there's an unexpired term, yeah. one of them is getting a full term and one of them is no, picking up. No, they don't have to come up for election in November. Oh, okay. Then, then it won't make any difference. You, you yeah. should ask the no, association. Should, it's the association. Oh, yeah, 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 call Jeff Hagel. Yeah, call Jeff. Jeff. Yeah. Call Jeff. Um, you know, you know the number, yeah. right? You know, it would be tricky if only two Four, six, five. Oh, no, 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 no. Huh? We've already, we, we're making sure everybody shows yeah, because up. You're, you're missing a person. You are, you're, yeah. you can't function. And the two of us are new. Look, we have, we have 11 members on the committee. Um, I, was, I was sweating because I didn't know whether we would have six today, and we did, fortunately. Um, it's, a, it's a real problem sometimes. Yes, Caroline. Thank you. Our supervisors of Delaware County, when they have their supervisors meeting, you can attend, but you can't ask any questions. Is that legal? Yep. Yes. Let me let me give you some background again. And is that there that's are, also the same at the local level, like a town board? Yeah. We don't have to allow it. <laughs> the open yeah, meetings law says nothing about public participation. Right. It says nothing about the public's right to speak, um, and yet many envision the open meetings law the way they think about the old-fashioned New England town meeting. Everybody has the right to get up and put in his or her two cents. It's not even the law in New England anymore. Um, 
the fact is that if your board does not want to permit public participation, they so are. be it. That is within its right. On the other hand, most boards do permit some sort of limited public participation. The suggestion has been, unless you like a free-for-all, uh, as the supervisor does, that, that you, you permit the public to speak by means of reasonable rules that treat members of the public equally, so that we can't say, well, Bonnie, we like you, we'll let you speak for five minutes, but Caroline, you're a real pain in the neck, we'll let you speak for two and then go. Um, also, for what it's worth, I, I, I live in what I've come to call the Stepford School District. You know, it's where all the kids are above average and all the teachers are wonderful. That's what every school district tries to tell us, and we know, we know that it's not true. Um, what if a parent gets up and says, oh, Johnny's teacher is just wonderful. God, they love that, don't they? What if the next parent gets up and says, Wait a minute, my kid has a same teacher, the teacher stinks, you know, what are they going to say? Out of order. Shut up, go away, out of order personnel. You know, there are federal cases indicating that if the door is open, it's open all the way. If the board is willing to permit praiseworthy comments regarding its staff, it must also permit critical comments. Now, if it wants to say, sorry, we won't accept any comments that focus on specific uh, staff members, that's their call. Everybody is still on an equal footing. Uh, but again, we have various principles, even though there is nothing in the law itself that deals with that issue. Okay? Now, I'd like to talk about that favorite word for going into executive session. <laughs> <laughs> that was cute. That was cute. I was just thinking about it. I'm going to go to the website. Personnel, 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 you personnel. You can read, you know, you can read FOIL too. It's not there. It's just not there. And yet, and yet, um, we have this myth, and, and one of my goals in, in old age is to <laughs> attempt to explode myths. How many times, you're the reporter, how many times have you ever heard somebody say, how many times have you heard on the radio, the TV, read in the newspaper, can't talk about it, it's personnel matter, it's confidential? Constantly. Constantly. Almost the only reason given, unless it's like... There's no law that says that. There's no law that says that. Could you hold on for just a second? <laughs> oh, crap. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Hello? Goodbye. I'm giving a talk. You know what? It goes on vibrate now. <laughs> Usually the only one who calls is my wife, and that was not a recognizable number. Sorry about that. Anyway, personnel, the myth. The myth. And the difficulty is, in all honesty, that we as Americans in too many instances are becoming stupid and sheep-like. We hear these statements over and over and over again, we begin to believe that they're true. And if we do believe that they're true, we lose our rights. How about this one? Can't talk about it, it's under investigation. Mm -hmm. What if they want to talk about it? What if it's in their you know, best interest? Then of course, of course they can. How about this one? It's in litigation, confidential. Anybody could walk into the courthouse and get whatever is there. Not if you're, now not it's if you're talking with your attorney. That's different. Okay. That's different. But in any case, let's talk about personnel for just a moment. <clears throat> just a moment. There are a thousand issues that can be characterized as personnel matters. Huh. What if um, your board is talking about the budget and you say to yourself, huh, can we really still afford this uh, position of, uh, you know, dog catcher? Whatever it may be. That's um, what if there's only one dog catcher? Everybody's going to know whose position it is, right? Yeah. No basis for going into an executive session. Why? The issue involves matters of policy. Huh. How do we choose to allocate public money? Is the function of dog catcher really important to our town? No basis for going into an executive session. On the other hand, if the question is, does our dog catcher deserve a raise? Is he or she doing a good job, a bad job? Should we keep him can or whatever? There, the focus in the words of the law is on a particular person. And the language of the exception is precise. I will quote it to you. It says that a board can close the doors to discuss the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation, or matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, demotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person or corporation. Ha! Huh. Ha! Huh. So, remember I said that there has to be a motion to close the doors? If your motion is, we want to discuss a personnel matter, nobody knows 
whether you're about to discuss a subject that may properly be considered behind closed doors. Hmm. So what do you do? Well, we have recommended what the courts have adopted. There's a motion <coughs> under that provision that includes two elements. Number one, inclusion of that keyword particular, so that we know that the focus is on either somebody or some corporate entity. And number two, reference to one of those qualifiers. I move to enter into executive session to discuss the employment history of a particular person, or something like that. You wouldn't name the individual, you wouldn't have to do that, but if you tell the world that much, what you're really saying is, yup, yup, we've read the open meetings law, and unless we're fibbing, we're about to discuss a subject that may properly be considered during an executive session. Yeah. Uh, it's about oath, oath of office. I know. And I'm not the guy. And I don't know a damn thing about oath of office. Interested in uh, your opinion, then. You don't want to talk about it? It's not my area. I'd be giving you the wrong answer. And I don't. Oh. Don't care. So when you, when you, go, to, when you go into executive session, yes. <coughs> you must state a, a, an a, act, reason. a reason. Yeah. And it has to be. And it so has to be kid, sufficiently. Detail that the public has a reasonable capacity to know that you're complying with law. Let me give you the other one. You mentioned you mentioned the other word that comes up fairly frequently, which yeah. is litigation. litigation. Huh. The law says that a board can close the doors to discuss proposed, pending, or current litigation. Right. Right. Well, people ask, what, what's the difference between proposed and pending, pending and current? I don't know. You don't have to know. What you should know is what the courts have told us. And going back years and years, the courts looked at that exception, and they asked the key question. And it goes back to what I said a little while ago. What is the harm that the legislature sought to avoid by creating this exception? And what the courts have held is that the intent behind the so-called litigation exception is to enable the public body to discuss its litigation strategy in private so as not to divulge that strategy to its adversary who, after all, may be out in the crowd. That's the last thing you ever want to do. Now, what about, well, I should, ask, I should add, in those same cases, the courts also said that the threat, the fear, the possibility of litigation without more is not a valid basis for closing the doors. If it were, let's face it, there would be nothing left of the open meetings law, right? <laughs> How many times have you heard, if you don't do it my way, we're going to sue you? Yeah, well, not good enough. Um, the motion, I'll tell you a story um, about a former reporter, Les, let's get arrested Hendricks. Um, yes, you said you were escorted. Les, Les covered the beautiful little town of Cobleskill, went to all the town board meetings, was at a meeting, and a motion was made, proposed pending a current litigation, get out Les. He refused to leave. They had him arrested. Well, before the judge could determine whether the charge should stick, he had to figure out whether the board complied with the open meetings law, and this is what he said. And he's a federal judge now, by the way. He wrote that a motion for entry into executive session cannot, quote, merely regurgitate the statutory language of the law to wit, proposed pending a current litigation, only a judge would ever write to wit. He said that the motion must identify the litigation. I move to enter into executive session to discuss the case of the XYZ company versus the town of Kogelskill. Again, the idea is to give the really? public enough information to have a clue that there really is a valid basis for closing the doors. Okay. More questions? Yes, good. In executive session, is it true that you can't take any action? No. Are you from no. a school board? No. <laughs> no. School boards generally cannot. Anybody else okay. can so long as, number one, you have a valid basis for being in executive session, and number two, you can't vote to appropriate public money in an executive session. Right. If you do take action during an executive session, the law requires that minutes be prepared indicating the nature of the action taken within a week. And the minutes are available to the extent required by the Freedom of Information Law. By the way, how many of you approve your minutes? Everybody approves minutes, right? There's no law that says that minutes have to be approved. Huh? Huh? You know, we all do it based upon history, policy, tradition, not law. But the open meetings law says that minutes must be prepared and made available within two weeks. Well, well gee, what if it's your practice or policy to approve the minutes? Two weeks have gone by and, and, and you haven't had the chance to do it. 
simple, simple response. The clerk or whoever prepares the minutes should do so, make them available on request within that time, stamp them, mark them, unapproved draft preliminary, something like that, so that the public has an idea of what transpired concurrently. The recipient is given notice to the effect that the minutes are subject to change. Okay? Foil, yeah. Foiling, too. If you take, if you tape your myth, if you tape your Meeting. meetings, yeah, they can actually get a copy. They actually can get foiling. You can get a copy of the whole tape. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, only within four months, remember, because then you can erase it. Yeah, but don't well, erase it if it requires. We don't. We don't. Right, right. 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 Um, <laughs> but that, I mean, that's pretty. I mean, that's a pretty good thing. Actually, there's case law. They got to pay for it. Goes back to 1978, indicating that a tape recording of an open meeting, yes, is indeed yep. available under FOIL. And it makes perfect sense. Anybody could have been there. Any, right. There's nothing secret about it. Yes? I have a question. There was a recent executive session that I was invited into. Can I ask about that question? <laughs> no, action, no, action was taken. You just okay. said it. Because it, it was public knowledge. Uh, was where we, there was a negotiation discussed about with the union. Now, this is employment, but it's a, it's a group that we're negotiating with. Well, well, if it's a union, one of the grounds, one of the grounds right. specifically indicates that a board could discuss collective bargaining negotiations yes. in private. In private. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. You have to. Yeah. No, you don't have to. You well, no, but it's wise. Yeah, you know, both FOIL and the Open Meetings Law are permissive. Um, generally, they say that, yes, a board may enter into an executive session, but you don't have to. What if there aren't enough votes to carry a motion to go into executive session? You can discuss whatever the issue may be in public if you want. Yes? What if uh, you FOIL for some information and you don't believe that you received all of that information? Oh. Then you go back to the town clerk or village clerk or whoever it is and say, thanks for what you gave me, but I don't think you gave me all the records that fell within the scope of my request. Um, can you please look again? Or, or if you believe that there was a, a, a denial of access that was purposeful, you should be informed of the right to appeal. And the appeal by law would go to the governing body, the town board, the village board, the city council, the school board, or the designee of that body. So yeah. I just want to go back to something you said, Marjorie. You were invited into an executive session? Well, I was invited in because I, it was after the election. It doesn't matter. So I'm the supervisor So elect. you were the supervisor elect, and you were invited in, and that is not at all atypical. Right. I'm a I was the guest. You were the guest. That, that's the political <laughs> caucus <laughs> language. But the Open Meetings Law says that the only people who have the right to attend an executive session are the members of the public body, but it also says that a public body may authorize others to attend, yes. such as you, as the supervisor elect. Mm -hmm. Huh. Supervisor invited you to possess. So do I have to call you Madame Supervisor from now on? Yes, as yeah. well as several other things I'm going to require that you do. But <laughs> wow, wow! I have no idea what she means, <laughs> but I can't wait. Huh. Huh. Wait a minute! I had another question. Of course, it's gone completely out of my mind. What town is he from? Oh, is there anything in the law currently about? Uh, I would really like to have our minutes available. Uh, within the two-week format online. That's up to you. It's, but that's it's, a choice. It's, 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 uh, There's nothing about hardship. It is, <laughs> it is more than prevalent at this point yes. that boards do that, yeah. but there is no obligation to do that. Now, for what it's worth, one of the key points made in this annual report involves so-called proactive disclosure. And that's exactly what you just described, where a government agency, instead of waiting for somebody to make a request, yeah. will post records on its website even in advance of a request. When you do that, let's face it, life is made easy. If the records are posted online, fuck, gee, your town clerk is not going to have to deal with That's requests. Right. People yeah. don't have to make requests. The records are simply there for the taking. And even if there is no law that requires that ever, certainly that's the trend. That's the trend right. in 2011 and beyond, right? For sure, for sure. Yes? Can you speak to the fact that, uh, that the, um, the people responsible for records have to enable, uh, they have to give you uh, records electronically if, they, if they're capable of doing so? Yeah. Can you just enlighten everybody on that? Sure. Well, there, there are a couple of points. Number one, um, in 2006, we saw an amendment that dealt with requests made via email. Is that what you're getting at, in part? Well, and even, uh, even for things that I've foiled. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's talk about this. 
Um, you know, people ask me every once in a while, which, which state has the best freedom of information law? All 50 states have them. My answer is Mexico. Mexico? Huh. I started dealing with the Mexicans about, I love to say this, around the turn of the century. Um, yeah. Um, I'm old, but I'm not that old. You know. Um, and they recognized that it was likely that 75 years of one-party rule were about to come to a close. They studied what we did in the U.S. and Canada primarily. Um, we actually received several delegations in Albany from Mexico. And by 2004, they passed a really terrific law. Their equivalent of our office has a staff of 280. You know? And in most states in this country, there is no equivalent office at all. Um, in most states, you have a question about what's public and what's, what's not. There's nobody to call. There's nobody to call. In any case, I was stunned, stunned to find out that during the first year of the implementation of the Mexican law, 40,000 requests were made, and among them, 36,000 were made and answered by email. Wow. Now, we know that not every Mexican family has a PC in the den. They don't have PCs, they don't have dens. Um, but the government was pretty serious about promoting the law, promoting transparency. It put kiosks and terminals all over the country. And wow. we hear of stories of people who we've probably characterized as peasants, who would go to the village hall or the school, tap out their requests one finger at a time and get it. That led us, in our 2005 annual report, to make a legislative proposal which miraculously passed less than a year later. And it's painfully simple. It says, government agency, when you have the ability to accept a request made by means of email, yes, you must. Huh. And if somebody asks that records be emailed back to him or her and you can do it, yes, you must. So what does that mean? That means that obsessed people, like reporters, can make their request at 4 in the morning. It means that often people can get the equivalent of the thick report quickly and easily. It also means, since the only fees that we can charge involve the duplication of records, it's free. Huh. So a lot of people are getting a lot of stuff now quickly and easily and for nothing. And even the government has begun to embrace this provision. Why? Nobody has to go to the filing cabinet and locate and pull out paper. Nobody has to stand at the photocopy machine. And best of all, in the eyes of many, nobody has to do the paperwork associated with taking in a court of report. So that's, that's sort of where we are on that issue. In terms of what I think you probably were getting at, a key provision in our freedom of information law, which was one of the first of its kind in the world, um, represented good fortune. When we were drafting what amounts to the current version of FOIL in 1977, realistically, we couldn't predict the future. Think about 1977. Can, can you think about 1977? No. Uh -huh. <laughs> High tech was an electric typewriter. Mm. We used carbon paper to make copies. Do you know what carbon paper is? I do know what carbon paper is. Oh, tell the truth. <laughs> College kids don't know. They got stuff that makes you dirty. Um, nobody dreamed of email. Nobody dreamed of the internet. But as I said, we got lucky. It was the beginning of the era of computers. Not the PCs on your desks, but you know, usually a big, big machine someplace in the basement. Um, since January 1, 78, FOIL has defined the term record to mean any information in any physical form whatsoever, kept, held, filed, produced, or reproduced by, with, or for a government agency. So if you've got it and it stores information in some physical form, it is indeed a record and falls within the framework of FOIL. In terms of your question, the thrust of judicial decisions as well as changes in FOIL indicate what I've come to call the if you can, you must principle of law. If you have the ability to make the data available with reasonable effort, if that means extracting data from your database, if it means making it available on a tape or a disk, and you can do it. And somebody, if so-and-so is willing to pay the appropriate fee, yes, we must comply with law. What are you thinking about? No, I, I, I notice now when I FOIL for any uh, state records, they're all sent electronically, even if it means that they have to, uh, you know, um, scan it. It's all scanning, scanning is an issue that isn't considered at all in the law, um, and there's no case law on the subject. Our advice has been that if so-and-so asks that records be emailed, 
um, and you would have to scan them first. If you have one of those devices that doubles as a photocopier and a scanner and it is no more labor intensive to scan than the photocopy, our guess is that a court would say, yes, you have to scan. On the other hand, if it is more labor intensive, because the record it appears in a bond bound volume, if there are staples, uh, whatever, um, if it's more labor intensive, our advice is you don't have to scan. Um, and you tell the applicant, yes, you can come in and look, or if you want photocopies, we can charge up to 25 cents per photocopy. Yeah, somebody had a question. Yes? It goes back to the website piece again, which is our minutes are very extensive and they have multiple attachments, for like bids and every other piece of that. And what I'm here negotiating, new, new supervisor, new town clerk <laughs> with her, is that I think according to your standard, it's motions, proposals, resolutions, and action taken and votes, we could post that bare minimum online and not have to do all the attachments and everything else. Well, the attachments, unless you incorporate them by reference as part of the minutes, no, I don't believe that you'd be required to do so. In my minutes, I put attached, I attached, I put attached resolution. Well, attached resolution, it seems to me, you would, you would want to put that up, you'd want to include it. More questions? I, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, my peripheral vision is <laughs> not right. quite that good. I just, I'm just curious of your opinion. I, I, I work with a bunch of people, and uh, oftentimes the public asks for a record, and several of the staff that I work with will oftentimes say to the public, well, you have to s submit a, a FOIL request for that information. And it sort of bugs me. My the action is, well, why would we tell them they have to do that? I, could you? It's up to you. You know, the law says That's that you may, you may require that a request be made in writing. But, new town clerk, if somebody walks into your office next month <laughs> and asks for the minutes of the last month's board meeting, you might say, sure, they're over there. The yeah, purpose yeah. of FOIL is to make life easy, not difficult. Not right. difficult, and there are any number of situations in which I think informality works best. Now, if you can't respond on the spot, fine. Then I think you say, well, you know, I would like something in writing, if only to have something that That's jogs your memory, to do it if need be. Huh? If somebody wants some, uh, minutes or something, do it, have them do it in writing. That way I have record who I gave it to. Who cares yeah, who you gave it to? <laughs> you know, That's under foil, on. you bring up an issue that is critical. Um, which, which town are you? Town of Middletown. Town of uh, Middle, Middletown. Yeah. Um, <laughs> If you're from Middletown or Timbuktu, you have the same rights under FOIL. It doesn't matter who you are. And you think about the email request. If I send you an email request using my home email address, you have no idea who I am. doesn't matter. Either the records are public or they're not. Right? Uh, Go no, through. it's oh. public, but you just have the right, you know, right uh, to say your, your request. No, excuse me? It's open to the public. I mean, everything's open to the public. It's just like you said you should have it in writing for whoever wants the paperwork, you know, from you. That way you have it. But that's a barrier. Yeah, that's a it's, a, it's a functional barrier. It's an impediment. Yeah. Actually, actually, you know, um, it was interesting. A, um, uh, an editor of a newspaper. Um, anybody here of uh, anybody here know about Glens Falls? Uh -uh. You know Glens yeah. Falls? Yes. Yeah. It's about 50 miles north of Albany. Yeah. Um, well, the editor of their newspaper told me, this was about five years ago, that he was going to start a freedom of information blog. And I said to myself, who the hell's going to be out? But it was immensely successful. And through the blog, he and his staff heard about things that they would not have known about otherwise. And he writes editorials. Huh. And um, I was going home one day, and I heard on the radio that this guy had won a Pulitzer Prize. <laughs> and, 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 and because I know the phone number by heart of many, many newspapers in this state, 7923131, I called right away and um, said, congratulations, Mark, what'd you win for? And he said, editorial writing. I said, what were your editorials about? Foil and the open meetings law. Amazing, <laughs> amazing. Glens Falls Post Star, not the New York Times, <coughs> not the Wall Street Journal, not the Washington Post, Glens Falls Post Star, Glens Falls Post Star. Um, so interesting, and one of the things that he told us, we invited him to a, a meeting of the Committee on Open Government. He said that seeking records by means of email is simply less confrontational than going to the desk or sending the old-fashioned paper request. It has made life so much easier 
from members of the public as well as members of the news media. Yeah. You're shaking your head. Yeah, but I know that town public servants feel attacked when reporters come up and say, I want a copy of your record. You just, and it's, that's not the idea. Nobody wants to feel attacked. I certainly don't want to attack anybody who's doing their job of reporting the minutes, you know? But making it easier, putting it out there, is it takes away that confrontation, it, it, even though it's not supposed to be confrontational. I say inundate them with information to shut them. That's <laughs> that's that's the new supervisor oh, oh, already. Yeah. 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 Oh. You sent the 40-page memo of minutes. I would be completely snowed. No yeah. idea. <laughs> so that's the point that I made before. That's that's called being killed with kindness, mm -hmm. yeah. right? You don't want See, that. You don't the want PR that. People are the nicest. You know, the separate the covered. wheat from the chaff. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just want to make note too that because uh, I often foil for these, uh, if you foil for environmental impact statements. Oh, they're huge. Uh, well, now under state law, if you do have a town website um, and you're having a public hearing um, on a DEIS or, or GIS or whatever, um, it has to be posted by law on the website for you to be able to access. It is now the way of the world. This from planning board? Is it planning board? I think any any the town, municipality the town, that, that has an environmental impact. Uh, uh, yeah, an any, EIS. any action that, that a requires a uh, environmental impact statement, any action that there's going to be a public hearing on, it has to be on your town website by law. Whoa. Okay. What if you don't have a town website? If you don't, then, then you're you know you can't do the impossible. <laughs> then you know then it's the Rolling Stones principle as well. You know that. You can't always get what you want, yeah. <laughs> but if you try sometimes, you just might find. Yeah. Don't you, Melinda? You look tired. Yeah, you have a great, a great name, Melinda McKnight. Thank it's mellifluous, is it not? <laughs> it's, it's, it's like Marjorie Morningstar. Yeah. Huh? <laughs> Excuse me? I don't say anything. I don't even go to the, I mean, you know, after four years of meetings and, and nothing but this, and then when there's some, some um, questioning by a, a town board member who may even hear about something enough in advance, it's, the discussion is to shut down. And they vote on I mean, it. Maybe they should grow back. Kind of astounding. Maybe yeah. they should grow back. Yes, what, 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 we're, 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 we're nearing <laughs> last week's here. Yes. Oh. You indicated that minutes have to be published within two weeks. They have to be prepared and made available. And you said stamp, draft, liner, or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When do they become official? There's no law that says that they have to be official. <laughs> you know, if you don't want to approve them ever, then you don't approve them. But the minutes are the official record of the meeting. Yeah, they are. You know, we should forget about these words like official. Uh, because they're, they're the they're, record of the meeting. Yes, yeah, the record yeah. of the meeting. So it never becomes official. Well, if the board says yes, we adopt this as our official record, great, but there's no obligation to do that. We have a tell them Huh? We've actually amended it. Yeah, well, sometimes you do if there's a mistake. If there's a error. Sure. Yeah, of course. I see our right, before, before, before everybody gets, yes, huh? Before everybody goes, I will make you an offer you'll never hear from a state employee ever again. Ask me anything. Go ahead. Make, make my day. No more? Do you do the workshop sale for town clerks? How did you train this woman from Marble Town? Because, because, you know, there's the Association of Towns. Okay. I've spoken there uh, about every year, I think, like this is one be on the in the past uh, 35 or 36. There is an Association This is the most fascinating part of the whole discussion. I know we didn't their conferences except one. That was because my daughter was giving birth.